What's up? We're back with another message. And the name of the message today is Deathbed Repentance, A Dangerous False Hope. Now, just to give a little bit of an introduction to this message, um, th I'm just going to let you know how this message is going to go. So, I am very aware that this is a sensitive subject, um, especially when it comes to people that are family and friends that you may think are lost or whatever it may be. And so, I I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to be approached. First of all, let me tell you the two main reasons I'm doing this, two main groups that I'm targeting with this message. First of all, are people that think that they can live in sin, live in rebellion their whole life, and they're counting on just calling out to God at the last second and jumping into heaven. And uh, so they, can, they think they're going to cheat God and get away with doing whatever they want and then get into heaven at the end at the very last second and then the other group of people are professing Christians actually and these professing Christians who I've talked to uh, a lot of, of, of different people who profess to be Christians and they say that you know whenever someone dies they say basically well we don't know at the last moment they could have called out to God and, and been saved and these types of things and they make it seem like you can't say after someone was died you can't say for a fact you know they weren't saved you know they didn't go to heaven they act, they act like and then it's almost like at every funeral everyone goes to heaven even though everyone could, there could know how it, you know they, that the person lived like the devil they were crazy but at the funeral oh they're so great they went to heaven whatever it is so those are the two main groups of people I'm talking, uh, aiming this message at. And I'm going to show you, not my opinion, not my feelings, just the Word of God. And that's the truth. You know, Jesus said, Thy Word is truth. And so the only way we can know what happens to people after they die, and to know the truth about salvation and heaven and all these things, is from looking at the Word of God. There's no other way. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what your feelings are. It doesn't matter what your traditions are or anything else or what your family thinks, your friends say. Even what your pastor says if it goes against the Word of God. It doesn't matter. If it goes against the Word of God, then it's wrong. Okay? That is the highest authority. That's the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. There is no other way. It's impossible to know the truth about spiritual things without the Word of God, the objective standard. Okay? So, having said that, um, we're, let me tell you what we're going to cover. We're going to cover, we are going to cover the thief on the cross in depth and a few other things to cover this topic of deathbed repentance. And, and one last thing I want to say is, um, I'm not going to lie to you to make you feel good. And that's not loving and that's not kind. I'm going to tell you the truth. And sometimes it might hurt, it might be uncomfortable. You might not like to hear it, but I can't, I can't in good conscience tell someone a lie to make them feel good. And there are a lot of preachers, pastors, whoever it is out there who will not tell the truth. They will avoid saying the hard truth to people because they don't want to make them upset. But guess what? That's not love. In fact, they will be held accountable for that in the day of judgment. It's a very, very bad and dangerous thing to do. And it's not loving. We have a very perverted idea of what love is today in our culture. Today, to love means to just never say anything is bad. To never say when something is wrong is a sin, these types of things. And just, we're not supposed to judge anything. But that's not what the Bible says. And that's not loving. It's not true love. Okay? Love warns. If you're in danger, love will warn you that you're headed down the wrong path. You're headed in the wrong direction. You're headed for destruction. Someone that loves you will tell you that to try to get you to turn around, go in the other direction. Someone that doesn't love you will say, oh, everything's fine, you're good, no problem everything's great meanwhile you're still heading in the wrong direction 
down the path of destruction. And that's not love. And so that's it for now. Just going to jump into the message. So first, let's deal with the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross is the most used reference in the Bible for people to say, well, you know, the thief on the cross got saved at the last moment. So we know that this can happen. So who knows? Almost everyone that dies, and maybe they were like the thief on the cross and they called out. And this is where this deathbed repentance, deathbed confession uh, comes from, the main source. Because really it's the only source. And we'll talk about that. So let's read that and then we'll break it down. Uh, we're going to read from Luke chapter 23, verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him against Jesus, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him. Okay, so Jesus, when Jesus was crucified, there were two other people crucified with him. Okay, one of them was attacking Jesus saying bad things to him, and the other thief on the cross rebuked that other person. And he said, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss, didn't do anything wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Okay. So let's break this down. Because there's actually a lot more here than you would think. If you just read past it really quickly, you might not, and you don't know the Bible really well, you might not pick up on everything that was there. Because there's quite a bit. So, this is the only example we have in the Bible of a deathbed salvation. That first point is a big point. This is the only instance in the Bible where someone was just about to die and they got saved. And, you know, there's another time when uh, Hezekiah was on his deathbed. He was sick. He was about to die. But he, was, he wasn't lost. In fact, part of his prayer, he says, Lord, you know that I've done good and what you wanted me to do throughout my life. And he gets basically an extension of some more years on his life after. But it had nothing to do with salvation. This is the only example we have of deathbed salvation in the Bible. But there's more to it than you would, would think. The thief expressed clear, genuine repentance. This is the first point. Okay, so let's talk about that. Because, you know, the thief in the cross is used to prove a number of different things. Uh, one, actually, to talk about this uh, from a different angle, the thief on the cross does show that it is possible to be saved without being baptized. Now, does the Bible say you should be baptized in water? Absolutely. Baptized by immersion, by the way. They went down into the water. But he was saved hanging from the cross without the baptism without any sacraments or any of these types of things, without works. And so the Bible shows salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not of works, lest any man should boast, as it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We know that. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be baptized if you have the ability. Some people like to use an edge case to, to prove, like, well, then that's we don't have to do anything because the thief got saved. No, that's not true. Otherwise, why is there all these commandments? And one of them is baptism. So if you get saved, you should be baptized after. It's an act of obedience after salvation and shows the work that was done in your heart that you were, when you got saved, you were buried with Christ and risen with him again. The old man dies and the new man is risen with Christ. That's what it shows. But let's continue. What we see, though, is a genuine repentance. And that's another thing is some people... Um, that attack the definition of repentance say, well, you know, what about the thief on the cross? Did he repent? Well, yeah, he did. He did. Now, he couldn't do anything after, and he didn't have any fruits of repentance, 
but we show a clear uh, change of attitude that he had. Because at the beginning, actually, he was also saying bad things to Jesus with the other uh, person on the cross. But then he repented. So, first of all, let's look at this. Let's break it down. The thief ex expressed clear, genuine repentance. First of all, he had the fear of God. The thief on the cross said, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Right? So he re one of, part of his rebuke to the other person was saying, Don't you fear God? You're in the same condemnation as we all are. We're about to die. And so when he's saying, Don't you fear God? He's expressing man, that he feels the fear of God. How, how come you don't? Right? Then the next point is, he confessed his sin and admitted that he deserved to be punished for his sin. Confessed his sin and admitted that he deserved to be punished. This is part of repentance. He said, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Okay? So, he, so the thief on the cross admitted, we indeed justly. It is actually just that I am punished for my sins. This is part of justice. And we receive the due reward of our deeds. What are the deeds? Their sins. Because of our sins, we're getting what we deserve. That's part of repentance. And then he confessed. Next is he confessed the sinlessness of Christ. He said, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Okay? He said, he said about Jesus, hanging there on the cross, he has done nothing wrong. He didn't sin. And he didn't. He believed and confessed that Jesus Christ was not just a man, but Lord of all, a king with a kingdom, the Son of God. Not just a man. He recognized, he, he confessed who Christ really was. He said, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Okay, so he's saying right here, I know you're going to come into your kingdom. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, like Peter said, right? You are, you have a, you are a king with a kingdom. He calls him Lord, which means master, ruler. He was confessing that Jesus Christ was more than just a man. And that was expressing his faith in Christ. Remember me, he says. Remember me. So he says, I'm, I receive the, uh, the punishment that I deserve for my sin. I fear God. And then confesses his faith that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Repentance and faith. Right on the cross. It's all right there. Now, some people try to twist the Bible because it doesn't use the word repentance, doesn't use the word faith, but it's all there. It's described clear as day. And the only, <clears throat> excuse me, the only way that you would think and say that it wasn't there is because you're trying to twist the Bible to make it a way of escape. So, this was a clear description of repentance and faith in Christ, Acts 20, 21 says testifying both to the jews and also to the greeks repentance towards god and faith to the lord jesus christ it was both there repentance and faith in christ now we always see that in the bible going together that repentance and faith are together the two sides of the same coin repentance doesn't save you but repentance is an act of the heart being sorry for your sin, hating your sin, turning from your sin in your heart, right? He couldn't, the thief couldn't turn from his life of sin right there um, to stop doing anything. It was in the heart. It's broken over it. And he, he's looking, turning from the sin, turning to Christ. Looks at him. And, and confessed, and he put his faith in him, okay? So only a repentant heart will put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there's that. Now, we're going to break this down more in terms of the whole deathbed confession thing. But that's what happened on the cross. Now, the next major point is that this confession was in public in front of many witnesses, including the other thief who was still reviling Christ. 
This was not done in secret where no one knew that it happened. It was recorded as a clear testimony. This was recorded, uh, this was witnessed by everyone there, by Christ, by the other person on the cross, by other people there could hear them, and it was written down, obviously. Someone saw it happen. They wrote it down. They were witnesses that this happened. And you know the Bible says to uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 1, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. If you want to know something happened? That's what the Bible says is, is the standard. It's good to have two to three witnesses to say, yes, this happened. Well, there we have it. Now, if there were no witnesses, we have no right to assume that someone got saved at the last minute. This is a first major point when it comes to this deathbed confession deathbed repentance uh, if there are no witnesses if no one says if there's no family or friends or anyone else that was there if someone uh, was on a deathbed they were dying or moments before death whatever it is or any time before that let's say days or weeks whatever and there's no one that saw and that can report that that person repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ they had some te testimony of salvation they made a profession of faith these types of things if no one says that you have no right to assume that the person called out for salvation none you have no right to assume that some professing Christians act like you can never say someone was lost when they died even though they're lost their whole life, as if we're uh, forbidden from stating the obvious when we have zero evidence someone got saved the last minute. We have no evidence. Their whole life they're lost. They reject the Bible, reject Christianity, live in sin. They don't care about the things of God. Then they die, and someone says, well, we don't know. Yes, we do know, actually. And the only way that we that it would uh, your mind should be changed is if we had a testimony to the contrary you don't default to someone being saved especially when Jesus warned that many wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be which go in there at okay and few to the narrow way why would you default to well they they you never know they were saved at the last minute they, well, actually we don't know that we don't like we don't have any evidence that proves that and and it's not just that it's not just that hey stop that we don't have any evidence it's that it's also evil and wrong to say that okay and this is what is so deceptive of our age and it makes me honestly sick to my stomach because it's a twisting of love these people act like they're the compassionate ones they're the loving ones and it's the opposite you are not compassionate you are not evil I'm sorry you are not you are doing something evil but you're not loving by saying well we don't know that they were lost and I'm going to show you from the Bible it is actually evil to give false hope to lost people that they can just pray real quick at the end of a life of wickedness God specifically warns against giving false hope to lost people okay let me I'm gonna read you some verses here this is a general principle Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 16 thus saith the Lord of hosts hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you they make you vain they speak a vision of their own heart you're just making it up out of your own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord it's not from the Word of God they say still unto them that despise me the Lord hath said ye shall have peace Wow so God is condemning false prophets, false teachers, or anyone really, that says to lost people, people that despise God, if you say to them, you will have peace, you will go to heaven, you will be saved. 
And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. Wow. So people that walk after the imagination of their own heart, these are lost people, right? They do whatever comes into their heart. You know, Jesus said that all sin and evil comes out, proceeds out of the heart of man. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's what the Bible says. But so people that walk after the imagination of their own heart, to say unto them, no evil shall come upon you. Don't worry. You can just, you live in complete wickedness and rebellion against God your whole life and no evil will come upon you. You will not face the uh, destruction at the end. You will not wake up in hell after you die. No evil shall come upon you. You know what God's saying about that? It's a wicked thing to tell lost people. Let me give you another one. Proverbs 24, 24. He that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse, nations shall abhor him. Abhor means extreme hatred, by the way. But to them that rebuke him shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon them. So if you say to the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse, nations shall abhor him. Abhor him. Very strong words against someone that tells a wicked person, a lost person, you're righteous. It's the same thing as saying, They're, you're saved. They're saved. What about after they die? Oh yeah, they were saved. What does that tell to all the other wicked lost people? Hey, you think they don't watch? You don't think they listen to you? Right? Imagine they watched their friend. These lost people, they watched their friend. He lived in absolute, they lived in absolute sin and rebellion their whole life. They never got saved. They never professed to be saved. They die. Then after their death, they hear you say, oh yeah, they went to heaven. What does that tell them? Aren't you preaching a message to them? And you're telling all those lost people, you can do the same thing. Live in sin, live in sin, live in sin. And at the end, you go to heaven. No problem. And that's what we'll say after you die. That's the message that you're conveying. Now, you don't think that God is upset with that, with you for, for saying those things? Well, it says, the peop, him shall the people curse. Nations shall abhor him. Doesn't that show you how God feels about people that do that? To, that tell the wicked that they're righteous? If you say a lost person may have gotten saved at the last minute, after they die with no evidence, you are spreading false hope to the living lost people and strengthening the hands of the wicked. Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 22, Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, and whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. If you promise the wicked life, you are strengthening the hands of wicked instead of that he should return from his wicked way, instead of that he should repent. Right? If you don't tell them to repent, but instead you promise them life, God says that's wicked. And it says that you are lying, by the way. It says with lies you have strengthened the hands of the wicked by promising them life. So guess what? You're also a liar. Again, listen, I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you the truth. Okay? I don't want you to just feel bad and, and all these other types of things. I want you, if you're doing this, to repent of it. And to stop doing this. Stop saying these things. Stop going around doing this. It's very bad. It's very dangerous. And you're messing with people's souls. And I don't like that. And God doesn't either. And you know how I know? Because it's in the Bible. That simple. The Word of God gives very clear warnings that lost people who live in sin their whole life will not go to heaven when they die. This needs to be preached very clearly as a warning to all. It is, I could quote so many passages about this, but I'm just going to give you one that is so clear 
that we know what the message is. It's in the New Testament. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now the Bible is so clear. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. It means unrighteous, the lost people, will not go to heaven. And then it, it says, don't be deceived. And then it lists a ca different categories of sin. And some people have more of a, uh, you know, habit of certain types of sins. They're drawn to certain sins more than others. That's why it says fornicators, drunkards, effeminate, all these other types of things. By the way, that includes the alphabet mafia, right? Now, but all these sins are in here, right? It includes everyone. It says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not go to heaven. Now, unless they repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that is supposed to be the message. And it's supposed to be clear. We're not supposed to apologize for that. We're just saying what the word of God says. We're just supposed to speak the truth. But when you say, oh, well, you know, this person, even though this person was, let's say, a fornicator, a drunkard, a liar, a thief, these types of things, they never made a profession of faith, never said, no one ever knew that they got saved. Then they die, and you say, oh yeah, they, 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 I think they went to heaven, or maybe they did the last second. You are denying scripture that says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. When the clear message should be, hey, you better watch out because the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you better repent before it's too late because you might die tonight, tomorrow, who knows? That's the clear message. Not that there's some secret, oh, maybe this, this person that lived in absolute wickedness their whole life, they secretly got saved at the last second and we don't know. We can't know. Yeah, we can actually and you're wrong and you will the only reason that you won't repent of that and admit that you're wrong is because of pride and maybe there's something wrong with your spiritual state because it's kind of weird that a Christian would go around saying that type of thing over and over and over again well we can't know yeah we can actually so why are you saying that Back to the thief on the cross, okay? Good. We're not done with the thief on the cross. Okay, I'm going to stack up the evidence here. We got plenty more. And I have some more examples in the Bible, and I have some good, really good quotes at the end about this, because this has been addressed throughout history, too. Back to the thief on the cross. This is a, here's the next point about the thief on the cross. This is a rare case. A rare case, like I said, the only instance we have in the entire Bible about a deathbed salvation. You may not have, here's the, the point about this. This is a rare case. You may not have a final moment like this. God does not guarantee a moment like this. Many lost people die every single day without warning. An opportunity for a deathbed repentance. To plan for a moment like this is to be presumptuous and tempt God. It is gambling with your soul. Now, i got a bunch of passages I'm going to read that back this up. But let me say this. Um, you, you, who says that you're going to get a deathbed moment? You know, not everyone dies in a deathbed, in a hospital, laying there for months or whatever it is. Final moments. A lot of people go out for a drive one night and they never come home. You, or if you, you, you know, there's a huge accident and a uh, tractor trailer comes barreling across the highway onto the other side, hits you head on. You think you're going to have time? There's no time. And there's many, many other instances. Thousands and thousands of people 
every day die without warning, without a deathbed? What makes you think that you're going to have one? It's very presumptuous. And again, I said you're gambling with your soul, you're tempting God, saying, ah, you think, what do you think, you're going to fool God? You think you can think in your heart and in your mind, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just do whatever I want for a while, and then once I get really old, I've lived it up real good, right before I die, I'll say, you know, I'll say a quick prayer, I'll be all set. You think God doesn't know your thoughts? You think he doesn't know about your wicked plan? Of course he does. Who do you think you're fooling? You think you're fooling God? You have really deceived yourself. God knows every thought that you've ever had and ever will have. He knows your plan. And what if he knows that you're planning on that deathbed and then he doesn't give you a deathbed? Because he knows what you're trying to do. Because you don't really care about your sin against a righteous and holy God. You don't care that you spit upon the sacrifice of Christ your whole life. You don't care about any of that and making peace with God. You just care about escaping the consequences at the last second. You don't really care about your sin against God. So let's read some uh, verses here. Proverbs 27.1 Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You have, when you wake up every day, you have no idea what's going to happen that day. No, you sure, you have plans. You can try to imagine what will happen that day. Even just a mundane day, you're getting up, you're going to work. I'll clock in, go work, clock out, come home, blah, blah, blah. You have no idea what's going to happen. You have no idea. Maybe something could happen like a train derails and spills a bunch of uh, dangerous chemicals. Was that in your plans? No. So what does it say? If you don't know what a day is going to bring forth, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Don't boast about tomorrow thinking you know what's going to happen, because you don't. Here's another verse, another passage, James chapter 4, verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Again, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You think you have all these long-term plans in your life. I'm going to do this, I'm going to go here, and do this, and buy and sell, and... And I have all these plans, but you don't know what's going to happen. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that vanish, appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Just like a little vapor. Like, you know, you put on a, uh, a teapot, a kettle on the stovetop, boil some water, some steam comes out, woo, and then it's gone. All right, that's how fast your life is. A little bit of steam, then it's gone. It's very short. And you don't know how short. Because you're not promised another day. Let alone promised to be able to live till 70, 80 years old. You have no idea. Why do you think that you're promised that? Do you think someone owes you that? Do you think you're entitled to, to live that long? think God owes you? For ye, that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. It's evil to presume that you know everything is going to happen and, and plan your life out like that, like nothing's going to interrupt your plans. Uh, and that's, it says, if you should say, if the Lord will. You should say, that's why Christians say, Lord willing when they make plans and they say they're going to do something. Tomorrow I'm going to go here and do this, Lord willing, if the Lord wills. And why do we say that? Because we don't know. If it's the will of God, we'll do that. If it's not His will, then we won't do it. Maybe something happens. Maybe there, your car breaks down. Maybe there's an accident. We don't know. It's up to God because God's in control. But if you rejoice in your boastings, it says it's evil, and Boasting is associated with pride. 
and that's what happens you're filled with pride so you think you're in control of everything oh god no it's not god right god's not what do you mean god it's not up to him it's up to me that's what you think no oh, god is in control and you again don't know what's going to happen tomorrow so don't presume you know what's going to happen here's more another passage it's going to get more intense ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11 i returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong neither yet bread to the wise nor yet riches to men of understanding nor yet favor to men of skill but time and chance happeneth to them all oh man a lot of people filled with pride who are strong wise they have money these types of things they get a lot of pride especially in their status right but they think they got it all figured out and they have people that have accomplished a lot of things man they figured man I've done all this and that's what I'm gonna continue to do wrong you have no idea you have no clue what's gonna happen verse 12 for man also knoweth not his time what's his time the day that you're gonna die you don't know the day that you're going to die. No one does. As the fishes that are taken in an evil's net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. It'll happen suddenly. Some reason you've deceived yourself and you think that you'll see it coming. You think today is going to go just like it has any other day. Tomorrow is just the same things are going to happen. Next week, next month, the same things are going to happen that have always happened. Wrong. When the, your time comes, when death comes, it comes suddenly. You will not see it coming. Not something you planned. Shocking, right? But you know what it compares it to? It says, as the sons of men are snared in an evil time, when it follows, some, it says it's as a fish taken in a net and birds caught in a snare. So just imagine that. The bird is, you know, hops to the, uh, the floor of the woods on the ground and there's a snare hidden under some leaves. And they're hopping along, enjoying their day. Next thing you know, they step in the trap, in the snare. It tightens around their foot. And they're stuck, and they're not getting out. And then the hunter comes and grabs them. Now, did they see it coming? No. Did they plan for that? No. Did they think that everything would just go as it normally does? Yes, just like you. They didn't see it coming. But your sudden death will come as a snare. Without warning. Here's another one. Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You know, there's only so many chances that God will give you. Did you know that? God's not just going to give you infinite second chances your entire life. It says, he that being often reproved, often reproved, what does that mean? Well, to be reproved means someone confronts you about your sin. Well, the word of God confronts everyone about their sin, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Everyone has sinned, right? That's being reproved for your sin. But maybe you, uh, someone tried to give you a tract. Someone tried to give you the gospel. So maybe you heard some preaching one time, right? Maybe you watched a video, but you ignored it. What is that? Uh, hardening your neck, hardening your heart, right? Why does it say hardening your neck? Because it's like you're tightening up. No, I don't want to hear it. Tighten up like that. I don't want to hear it. So you continue on with your life, living in sin, living in sin, doing whatever you want. You're hardening your neck. Then maybe you hear another warning another day. You harden your neck. You don't listen. God's not going to do that to you forever. 
He's going to give you chance and chance after chance. But one day the chances are going to run out. And you're not going to be reproved anymore. And you know, what's, you know what comes after that? Suddenly shall, uh, shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. Sudden destruction. That's when your time comes. As I've been talking about. When you least expect it. Death. Your time will come. Oh, it's not fair. It's not fair. Uh, you know, what if I, I just need a little more time? No, you had your time. And you wasted it. And you spit upon the sacrifice of Christ. You denied the word of God. And not only that, a lot of times you attacked everyone who tried to warn you. Oh, they're oh they're hateful and they're, oh, I don't want to hear it. They're annoying and, and all these other things. Great. That's how you feel. Okay, well, it's only going to happen so much. You're only going to get so many chances. And then one day, suddenly, shall he be destroyed. And the people that love you the most are the ones trying to warn you before the sudden destruction happens. Proverbs 6.15 Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Starting to see a theme here? The calamity comes suddenly, suddenly broken. That's how God does it. Especially to those who consistently ignore his warnings. Here's another one. Psalm 73 verse 18. Here's where it talks about that when you have, uh, when you live presumptuously, you presume that you're secure, everything's good, going fine in your life, but you're not saved. You know, this is what the Bible says about you. This is a description. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought down into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. It's talking about lost people. You've never been born again. If you never put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's you. It's talking about you. And it says, God has set you in slippery places. Imagine you were walking on the side of a mountain in a very narrow path. And it's all wet. Water dripping down. The, wa the, the rocks are slippery. There's, maybe there's some algae growing here, right? At any moment, you could take a one wrong step, slip off, and you're dead. God says that's where you are right now. Every single moment in every single day of your life, you're walking in slippery places. And at any moment, you could slip off, die, and you're in hell. And you never come back. And I'm warning you right now. As in a moment. One moment you're here, the next moment you're not. You're gone. Now, there is a, there is a, those are all the passages that we're going to talk about that warn about you not boasting about tomorrow, thinking you're going to get that deathbed, that get that deathbed repentance, because you, you most of the time won't get it. And there's a lot of sudden death, sudden destruction, without warning. No idea what's going to happen tomorrow. So don't, you cannot bank on a deathbed repentance. There are warnings about God not listening to those who ignored God plea, God's pleas when the time for judgment comes. That's another one. I was, you know, I was kind of talking about this a little bit, but you know, God mentions this in the Bible where he warned people over and over and over again, reached out to them, trying to get them to repent. They refused to listen, refused, refused. And then at that last moment when they're experiencing the consequences of their actions, they cry out, no, no, no. And then it says, he doesn't listen anymore. He said, no, the time to listen was before when I tried to warn you over and over and over again. I'm not listening anymore. Now that you now that you experience the consequence for your actions, oh, now you want to listen. No, it's too late. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 11. But they refused to hearken. 
and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Wow. So it says that God was warning them. He cried and they would not hear. It says they refused to hearken. They pulled away their shoulder. They stopped their ears so they didn't have to hear. They hardened their hearts. I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. No, I don't want to read that stupid gospel tract. No, I don't want to watch your stupid video. No, I don't want to go to church. No, I don't want to talk to you about Jesus. It's all stupid. Garbage. It's hateful. Bunch of bigots. It's only going to happen so many times. Tried to warn you, tried to warn you, tried to warn you. And then what happens? As the, he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear. How come you don't realize that maybe you were warned and warned and warned and warned and then at the right before the moment of your death you go, Oh, I don't want to die. Please, God, help. I, I, you know, I, I'm ready to listen now. And he doesn't hear. Where does it say in the Bible he has to hear? Maybe he's done. He's done hearing. Because he tried to tell you, tried to warn you. And now, your time is up. And that's what it says right there. So they cried and I would not hear. Wouldn't listen. That's what the Bible says. Right there. That's up to God. God is in control. Here's another one. Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. He will hide his face, will not hear them, even though they cry unto him. Will that happen to you? I don't know. Are you going to gamble? Are you want to take the chance? You want to tempt God and gamble and see if that's what happens? Are you going to get the chance or not? I don't know, but I wouldn't try it if I were you. If I were you, I would listen now. I would take it seriously. There are warnings against despising the long-suffering of God by presuming you can continue in sin and put repentance off for another day. If you think that that's what you're going to do, oh, I'll just... You know, I'll just do whatever I want, and then one day I'll just, uh, you know, I'll repent later. When I'm old, on my deathbed, I'll do it then. You know, the Bible says that's despising the long-suffering of God. Because every day that God doesn't uh, kill you and throw you in hell, that's the long-suffering of God. Because you live your life in sin and rebellion against God. You don't care to break His commandments every single day, spit in His face, and do whatever you want. You don't care about God at all. And so, during that time that God doesn't, you know, take your life, send you to hell, during that time, that's God expressing His long suffering towards you. He suffers long with you. He puts up with you. And allows you to, as I said, have chance after chance after chance. Every breath that you take every day you wake up is another chance to get right with God. And then you still continue on in sin and you make this plan. That's despising the long-suffering of God. Let's see what the Bible has to say about that in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, it's supposed to. You experience the good things of God. He allows you to have food and drink and these types of things and money. You think, oh, I go to work and I make all my money. That's all me. God allows you to do that. All right? At any moment, God can have you fall off of a uh, ladder and break your legs. And then 
You can't go to work. Oh, now what? Now you can't work for your own money. Well, that's up to God, right? That's not up to you. And so everything is a gift from God. Every single thing you have. That's from the goodness of God. And it's supposed to lead you to repentance. But when you despise God, you're, you're, despising, you're despising His goodness, you're despising His long-suffering as well. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up thy, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. You will be held accountable for your deeds, for your sins, everything you've ever done. You will be judged by God. Now, it says, one more thing I want to highlight is it says, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart. Okay? A hard heart is an impenitent heart. An impenitent heart means a heart that refuses to repent. That's what impenitent means. You refuse to repent, but you want to continue in sin. You know what it says? Those that have a hard heart that refuse to repent, they treasure up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You are treasuring up wrath, building up more and more wrath against you every day that you harden your heart and refuse to repent towards God. And you're despising His long suffering. So, if you presume that you can continue in sin, put repentance off for another day, this is what you're doing. You're actually just treasuring up wrath for yourself later. Not the mercy of God. Let's continue. The command... Okay, so now, what is the command, right? The command is not of God is not put it off for another day. The command is to repent now. The command of God is to repent now, not to wait and put it off for another day. Let's look at what the Bible says. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Everyone, everywhere, God commands to repent. It is so clear in the Bible, you can't mess this up. It's not confusing, it's clear. Okay? There's no misinterpreting this. He commands you to repent now. Not to wait. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to get saved. It's not to put it off for another day. Because again, if you think, well, I'll just wait another day, that day may never come. That's not me speculating, fear-mongering. It's just reality. It's facts, and I already showed you a bunch of verses talking about this. What makes you think that you can count on another day, that it, that day will ever come? Now is the day of salvation. That's when you're commanded to, to repent and get saved. Repentance, next point, repentance is a gift of God. That's another important point. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. God granted repentance to the Gentiles as a gift. Here's another one. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Okay? Again, Give them repentance? Yes, because giving them repentance as a gift to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, I'm going to explain this a little bit more before I get into the next point. Uh, repentance, okay, so repentance is a gift. The next point is repentance is a response to pricking of the heart or conviction, conviction by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, this is something people like to argue about, but it's pretty simple, okay? You don't, repentance is a gift. So it's absolutely false that somebody just, anytime they want, they can just muster up conviction from the Holy Spirit of their heart, of the whole life of sin. That doesn't happen. It has to be the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart, convicting you of your sin. I'm going to read some verses about that. But 
you can resist that conviction. I believe the Bible is very clear about that. Stephen said that ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Okay? So when that pricking of the heart comes, that conviction of the Holy Spirit, that can be resisted, and that's where people harden their hearts. Okay? And that's, you know, that's a debate about, everyone gets into a debate about free will and all these other types of things, but this is clearly taught in the Bible. Very clearly taught. Okay? That it's a gift... And that, you know, there has to be a pricking of the heart and a conviction of the Holy Spirit, but also that can be resisted. People can. It's not that it's irresistible. No, it can be resisted. And that's why they harden their hearts. But anyways, let's not get off on the sidetrack of that. Repentance is response. It's a response to the pricking of the heart and conviction of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Uh, now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. See, there it is. What does it mean to be pricked in the heart? Well, they, a lot of times, if you read about the definitions, they talk about it being like an ox goad. Something that you poke an ox with. Very sharp. Okay, so that's pricking your heart. It stings you. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, What's the first thing he said? Repent. He said to repent. What did Paul say we just read? Commands all men everywhere to repent. Okay? So the proper response to the pricking of your heart is to repent. Here's the next one. This is contrasted with just wanting to escape the consequences of a life of sin at the last minute and trying to muster up repentance out of thin air. Okay? That's where we have to see that. The, all these verses are important to know when it comes to that. Okay, so repentance is a gift from God. We know that it's a conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's a pricking of the heart, but there has to be a response of repentance towards that conviction. All right, we got that. That is contrasted with people thinking, well, uh, at the uh, I'm maybe they felt conviction before. Some people, this has been documented multiple times where uh, I've heard old messages about this too, sermons where the preacher talks about they were preaching a message and there was someone who was clearly feeling conviction, but they were resisting it. And they're gripping the uh, pew in front of them till the knuckles are white, tears coming down their face, but they're hardening their neck and they're refusing and refusing and refusing they're fighting against it, resisting it. As I said, that isn't going to happen at unlimited times in your life. It's not going to happen at unlimited times. So, someone just wants to escape the consequences at the last minute, right? They live a life of sin, doing all kinds of wicked things, and then right before about their, they're about to die, they get scared of death. Oh, I don't want to suffer the consequences. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to do this, this, and this. So I'll just, out of nowhere, oh, I'm sorry. You're just going to muster it up out of, of thin air. But do you really mean it, though? And Or you're just saying that because you want to escape the consequences. And if, what if God let you live after that? Would you, be honest with yourself, would you go back to doing the same exact things you've always done and go back to that life of sin or would it be a genuine change don't lie you can't lie to God you can lie to me you can't lie to God so that's the contrast between those two things in the scriptures no one had a problem saying okay this is the next point okay so that's all to do with uh, repentance and uh, as a gift and conviction and all these other types of things you, who says you can just muster up this conviction right right before you die that's garbage you know it's this false uh, false gospel of the one two three repeat after me quick little sinners prayer thing where people say something with their mouth but they don't believe and repent in their hearts just because you say something with your mouth doesn't mean you believe it in your heart and you know that uh, 
but here's another major point, okay? And this is specifically focusing on the Christians, the professing Christians who say, well, we can't say someone definitely went to hell. Well, that was said multiple times in the Bible. In the scriptures, no one had a problem saying that someone definitely died and went to hell. No one had a problem with that. Here are some examples of saying someone was lost and went to hell. I'm just going to go through these real quick. Judas, clear example, right? The apostles said Judas went to hell. Acts chapter 1 verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. What's his own place? Hell. They said he went to hell. Okay? All of these apostles said, Judas went to hell. No problem saying it. Well, maybe he called out the last second. Maybe he called out when he uh, was hanging. No. Garbage. They said he went to his own place. Here's another one. Jesus speaks of the eternal fate of Judas. John chapter 17, verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in my, thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Jesus said, none of these apostles that you've given me are lost, except for the son of perdition. Who's that? Judas. He is lost. Jesus had no problem saying that. And another time he said he was a devil. Mark 14, 21. The son of man indeed goeth, and as it was written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. How about that warning? Not only did he say that, you know, Judas went to hell, he was lost, but he also said it was good that he should never have been born. And you might say, well, I'm not, I'm not, come on, man, I'm not Judas, I didn't betray Christ. You betray Christ every time you spit upon his sacrifice and reject the gospel from people that love you and try to tell you about the truth. You are Judas. You, you Jesus Christ took your sin, the punishment for your sin. He rose again from the dead. He gave, he's offering the gift of eternal life. When you reject that, yeah, you do betray Christ. You do spit upon his gift. Because you want other things. You know, you know what happened with Judas? He would rather have all these other things. He could have had Christ, salvation in Christ, but he chose the bag of money. He was covetous. And he took that instead of Christ. You do the same thing. When you say, I want my sin, a life of sin, instead of Christ. That makes you Judas. Jesus speaks of the fate of the Pharisees who would not repent. You know what he said to the Pharisees? Did he, uh, did, did he say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? No, he said, Matthew 23, 33, Ye serpents, ye generations of viper, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Yes, that's what Jesus said. So, you like to put that in your social media profile that you're a follower of Christ and to be Christ-like and we need to do this and that. Well, here's being Christ-like. How shall you escape the damnation of hell? That's what he said. So he had no problem talking about their fate. That a lot of those Pharisees would go to hell. They had no problem with that. And now the clearest one that Jesus had no problem talking about was the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus Christ preached about a rich man that died and went to hell. Jesus described the fate of the lost dead rich man in detail as a warning to all about hell. Okay, he didn't just tell this story about this event that actually happened, by the way. It's not a, par a parable. And it's not a parable because real names are used like Abraham. Jesus didn't just make up a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, false story a parable story just to and then use Abraham's name in the story and well that you know Abraham's in the story but it never really happened with Abraham it doesn't he never does that there's never a case where they make up a fake story about someone that was a real person 
Yes, this really happened. And Jesus describes it. Okay? And he would know, right? So Jesus preached about a rich man. It was, a, okay, so it was a warning. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. This was a warning. It wasn't just to tell a story and say, wow, look at what happened to this rich man. It was to warn everyone else. Hey, this guy was lost. He went to hell. This is the fate that he suffered. This is a warning to you. You don't want to suffer the same fate. So let's read in Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed with in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, in hell, okay, Jesus says, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, saying, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Okay? So, this is a warning very clearly. The rich man, it said, how? where did he end up? In a place where he it says he was in hell, it says he was in torment, it says he was tormented in this flame, in fire. And the point is, Jesus had no problem saying, this man, this rich man was lost, he died, where did he go? Hell. He didn't lie about him, saying, well, maybe he, I don't know, we don't know, we can't say where he went. We don't know. Jesus takes the opposite approach. He says, not only do we know where he went, I'll tell you. In fact, I'll describe in detail what happened to him after he died as a warning to all the living. How much is this contrasted with these professing Christians who say we can't say what happened to someone when they died? Another thing that Jesus did you might skip past this really fast and not notice what he did. But Jesus himself used a recent tragedy where 18 people died to warn of uncertainty of life and the need for repentance. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 13 verse 4. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell slew them and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now we see this is, you know, Jesus is talk, uh, preaching an important message about, again, the necessity of repentance to everyone, right? He's saying, you know, just because they suffered this fate, that doesn't mean they were more wicked than everyone else. You never know, the, right? The uncertainty of, of life, what should happen? He's saying, no. Same thing with you. You need to repent. Everyone needs to repent. Doesn't mean they were more wicked, right? So that's that's that message. But I, what I want you to focus on is that he this was a tragedy where 18 people died because a tower fell on them. So imagine that. Imagine there was something that happened nowadays. A building collapsed and a bunch of people died. Or, you know, some other accident happened. A bunch of people died. And then imagine a preacher said, hey... You think that those people were wicked because they suffered such, you know, they must have been awful to suffer some type of fate like that, right? No, because that was a common belief at the time, right? He said, no, you need to repent before it's too late. Imagine a preacher said that today. Hey, you better repent before it's too late because look at what happened to these people that just died in this accident. Oh, people would be furious. They'd be upset. They'd flip out. That's what Jesus did. And people pretend that they're they're uh, followers of Christ, but they don't like actually the words of Christ and the example of Christ. They like to cherry pick little things here and there 
and not get the full picture. Okay? So, yes, he used re the recent death of some people to warn about the necessity of repentance and warn about the uncertainty of life. Because, look at this. They were there, everything was going fine, and then all of a sudden, a tower fell on them, they're all dead. Like I said, you never know what's going to happen. Why do you think that you do? Okay, now we're going we're gonna to wrap up the message with a few descriptions of uh, examples of death. This is important to go through. I'm not going to offer a lot of comment on it, just so we can wrap up the message. But the scriptures have graphic descriptions of death and the judgment of God on lost people after a lifetime of wickedness as a warning from God. Over and over again, God does this. And I'm going to give you a few examples, but there's a ton more that I could include that I didn't. Okay? And, by the way, these are coming from the Old Testament. But you know what the New Testament, you know what the New Testament says about examples in the, in the Old Testament? It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for our, for examples. For examples, they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay? So, they were written, it happened unto them, and written about for examples for us. Okay, so it's good to look at these examples. Okay, so here's some examples that are used in the Bible as warnings to people who live a life of wickedness of how they're, how it's all going to end up for them when they live in, in, in rebellion against God. First example is a woman. A, the most wicked woman in the Bible, Jezebel. It's a very good illustration for today because we have a society, a world filled with women just like her. Not just picking on women, I'm just saying that they also need to hear this. Second uh, Kings chapter 9, verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard it heard of it and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at the window and as Jehu entered in at the gate she said had Zimri peace who slew his master and he lifted up his face to the window and said who is on my side who and there looked out to him two or three eunuchs and he said throw her down so they threw her down and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and he trod her underfoot he drove over her body with the chariot and when he was come in he did eat and drink and said go see now this cursed woman and bury her for she is a king's daughter and they went to bury her but they found no more than her skull and the feet and the palms of her hands wherefore they came again and told him and he said this is the word of the lord which he spake by his servant elijah the tishbite saying in the portion of jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of jezebel and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field and the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. Wow. Very bad ending for Jezebel. She was thrown out a window out of a tower. She was driven over by a chariot. And then her dead body was eaten by dogs. And then you know what happened after that. That's what God thought about Jezebel. Jezebel was a very wicked woman who was a liar, a manipulator, master manipulator. And her husband, Ahab, was king of cucks. He was a simp. He was a passive, effeminate man who wouldn't do what he was supposed to do, so his wife took charge, signed uh, documents in his name, lied to have a man, an innocent man named Naboth, lied to have him killed, and his vineyard stolen from him. That's Jezebel. She also did a lot of other wicked things. Killed prophets of God. But look at her end. And you know, right before this happened, right, her whole life, she probably thought she was going to get away with it, right? She kept doing all these wicked things over and over again with no fear of God, no fear of the consequences. Until that day came that she was thrown out the window, ran over, and her body eaten. That's a warning. Here's another one. Haman. Oh, Haman is another one. Haman is the probably the most ironic fate and death in the Bible. Because Haman had 
wanted to kill all the Jews. And he specifically, specifically a man named Mordecai, he absolutely hated him. And he built some gallows that he wanted Mordecai hung on. But you'll see what ends up happening. So, for we are sold, I, okay, so uh, Queen Esther comes in. She's trying to save her people, the Jews. She comes to the king to intercede for them and try to get the king to stop this from happening. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? Who is making all these plans to kill your people? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Pointed him out. It's Haman right here. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Oh, now, hey, look at it. It's Haman. Right before Haman's about to die, it says he's afraid. Oh, maybe that means he's getting saved. No, he's afraid of the consequences. You think if he wasn't going to get away with it and wouldn't have suffered his fate, he wouldn't have went ahead and killed all those people? Of course he would. He's only afraid... Because now he's caught. He was afraid, and the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. He knew what was going to happen to him. The king was going to go after him. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? So the king comes in, and Haman's laying on the bed that Esther's on, and he's pleading with her, right? And then the king comes in and says, What, are you going to rape my wife too? It made him even more angry. And as the word went out from the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face, bagged him. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold, also the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was pacified. So Haman was hung on the gallows that he built to kill Mordecai, someone else. And that's, that was all orchestrated by God. Now, Haman had conspired against God's people. He wanted to kill them. He made all these plans, but God saw it the whole time. He knew what he was planning. And in the end... He got it. You think Haman was expecting this was going to happen? No. Not at all. And again, it's a warning to the wicked. You think you're going to outsmart God and you're, you're going to get away with your plans? You will not. A couple more short examples will be done. Herod is another quick example. Acts chapter 12, verse 21. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. Okay, so Herod, he was giving this speech. They said, Oh, it's the voice of a God. It's, it's like he's a God. But didn't give God the glory. He took the glory for himself, and so God killed him. Think he was expecting that? No, not at all. But when you sin against God, you are filled with pride, you refuse to repent. You never know when God will take you out. And the last example is Nabal. So, in this example, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, uh, in this example, David, King David and his men were going throughout the wilderness and they were really hungry and they needed some food and they asked, you know, uh, this man, Nabal, he had a wife named Abigail, they asked if they could have some food. Nabal had a really bad attitude 
didn't want to give David any of his food. He said, who is this guy? I don't care. Get them out of here. And he didn't want to help them. Well, David was mad. All of his men were about to come in there and kill him. And uh, they were about to suffer. Nabal was about to suffer the consequences. But uh, Abigail intervened to, to stop that. So, by giving some gifts. But see, let's see what happens. First Samuel chapter 25, verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. So Nabal was, again, not expecting anything bad. Nabal was having a feast. He was happy. Nabal's heart was merry within him. He was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning... When the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. Wow. You know, Christians love to, to talk about that. Oh, David, 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 David. He was so great, right? Well, he said, The Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head after he died. Did David say, Well, maybe at the last moment he, he cried out and and I don't and no one knows what happened to him when he died. Yeah, God killed him, he went to hell, he's wicked. David said he was a wicked man. Thank you, God, for taking him out of the way. That's what happened. And God killed him. And Nabal wasn't expecting it. The night before, it was the night before Nabal, uh, it, well, it says his heart died within him and he became stone. And then God killed him a little bit after that. But basically, before his heart died within him, the night before, he was feasting, having all this stuff. You think he had any idea the next morning he would wake up and hear that news? He had no idea. Guess what? This is another warning to you. Warning to the wicked. Here is the conclusion. Okay? We are to warn about the dangers of living in rebellion against God. The death of the wicked is used many times by God as a warning. That warning is destroyed when a professing Christian says that we can't say for sure a lost person went to hell. Oh, we can't say. Yes, we can. In fact, not only can we, we should. Okay? Now, I'm saying when we have a clear, we have clear knowledge that someone had no testimony all it was was sin. They rejected the gospel. And we know that for a fact, then it's our duty to warn. We should offer no hope to the wicked of a deathbed repentance escape hatch. That is a very bad, dangerous thing. It's casting a stumbling block before lost people, and you will be held accountable before God for doing that. Instead, we should preach about the urgency of repentance and faith in Christ now before it's too late. Okay? We need to preach about that. That the message is repent of a life of sin and rebellion against God and put your faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's not You're not saved by your own works. It's by faith in Jesus Christ that he took your sin, the punishment for your sin. He rose again from the dead. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You put your faith in him. Right? But we tell people, the time to do that is now. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent now. And the urgency of that. And saying you don't know if you're going to survive. If you're going to live another day, another hour. You don't know. That's what we should preach. The urgency of it. And uh, one more thing. I'm going to read a couple quotes and we'll be done. And there will be extra special accountability for pastors preachers whoever it is that lie to people when they see when there's a clear case of someone was lost 
They lived in wickedness their whole life. They never made, they never got saved. They never had a true testimony. And then they say, oh yeah, they went to heaven. That, I fear for that person. You are not going to have a good time when you stand before God. That's all I got to say about that. Now, I'm going to end the message with a couple quotes about deathbed repentance. That's a couple uh, quotes that I found. One from J.C. Ryle. Some really good quotes here. And then we'll be done the message. But I thought these were some good quotes to summarize this subject and, and, and the proper view that we should have. So this first one's from uh, J.C. Ryle. I dare say you are planning on a late repentance. You do not know what you are doing. You are planning without God. Repentance and faith are the gifts of God, and they are gifts that he often withholds when they have been long offered in vain. I grant you true repentance is never too late, but I warn you at the same time, late repentance is seldom true. I grant you one penitent thief was converted in his last hours that no man might despair, but I warn you, only one was converted that no man might presume. One more by J.C. Ryle. I know that people are fond of talking about deathbed evidences. They will rest on words spoken in the hours of fear and pain and weakness, as if they might take comfort in them about the friends that they lose. But I am afraid in 99 cases out of 100, such evidences are not to be depended on. I suspect that with rare exceptions, men die just as they have lived. And one more quote. I don't know who the source is. It's unknown. But this has often been said. Those who wait to repent until the 11th hour often die at 1030. It's very true. Again, like I said at the beginning, I know this is a tough subject. I know that uh, no one wants to think about lost family and friends dying and going to hell. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. That's God doesn't want them to either. But he tells them to repent. And if they don't, then they suffer the consequences. They make the choice. And so, we can't let our feelings cloud our judgment and, and take away the truth of the Word of God. Um, the truth is the truth. We can't lie. And you're not helping anyone by lying. Again, it's not from a place of love. That's not love. It's not love to... Uh, avoid telling the truth to someone because you're, you're worried that they might get upset. Trust me, when you die and you stand before God, you're not going to worry about, you know, oh, I warned someone and they got upset with me. You know, obviously, I'm saying, you know, I have a bunch of videos about witnessing to people. Don't, you know, you should have a good attitude and have charity with people. But you don't, but you don't avoid speaking the truth. And you don't avoid giving people at least one chance, trying to give someone a track, trying to talk to them about the gospel, trying to open up the conversation, do whatever you can. But if they reject it, that's their choice. So anyone who was uh, trying to count on the deathbed repentance, take heed to these warnings. Do not ignore them. And everyone else who tries to say we can't say... Uh, someone dies when they're lost or we don't know if they call the last moment and stuff like that you're wrong you're dead wrong you are you're denying the Bible you're against the Bible stop spreading this false gospel really false idea and um, that's pretty much it thank you for watching listening Please like, share, subscribe, check out the links below, especially click in the description. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the Telegram feed. It's the most important place to go where you're going to get everything, all notifications for all messages with video or audio, also the PDFs, 
will be put in there news updates other ministry updates uh, all types of things like that and if i get censored you'll be able to find out uh, where i am from there thank you for all the support and all the prayers god bless you have a good day